the Himalayas, where Earth meets sky. Prowling this broken landscape is one of the most rarely seen creatures on Earth, the snow leopard. So elusive, only a few are privileged to catch a fleeting glimpse. Veteran filmmaker Hugh Miles and his team spent four years fighting freezing temperatures and dangerous altitudes. Sometimes these mountains can seem cruel and the sub-zero temperatures feel unrelenting. Their dogged determination is rewarded with never-before-seen footage. But glimpse it for a moment, and then it's gone. Some parts of our planet are so brutal that any creature surviving in them achieves almost mythical status. And when a creature thrives in these conditions, it becomes legendary. One such creature lives here in the world's greatest mountain range, the highest, the most hostile, the Himalayas. Towering above India's northern borders, these unforgiving peaks are its hunting grounds. The creature is a beautiful big cat. Merely to see one is a dream, but to film one, nearly impossible. It's a wildlife filmmaker's holy grail. The snow leopard. This is the story of two remarkable men who dared to think the impossible. They believed they could find and film the snow leopard up close and personal. It would take the team four years to conquer this Everest of the natural world. Like many mountain adventures, it was a quest that was to end in both tragedy and triumph. But all that was to come as veteran filmmaker Hugh Miles and his team headed into the mountains on their first expedition. I've wanted to make a film about snow leopards for as long as I can remember not just because I love cats, but because the bigger the challenge, the greater the rewards, or so they tell me. <laughs> Trouble is, I think I'm probably too old to keep climbing these precipitous mountains every day. So I hired wildlife filmmaker, Mitchell Kelly, to spearhead the challenge. I've been crazy about snow leopards ever since I was a young fella. They're beautiful and they're rugged and they're mysterious and they must be Perhaps the most potent emblem of wildness left on the planet. When you look at terrain like this, you realise why snow leopards are so difficult to film. But it'll be almost impossible to film them alone. So up ahead is Numgil. He's the horseman and he lives in the village just up valley. And he's an incredible animal spotter. We also have Cheetah as the chief guide. And they've, uh, they've both seen snow leopards quite a few times. These local mountain people are incredible. They're tough, they're resourceful, and they have a great sense of humor. And no doubt they'll need all these qualities before we finish this okay. film. But we need a special place as well as special people if we're to succeed. And we think we have that too. Snow leopard populations are fragmented and they're thinly distributed throughout the remotest mountains of Central Asia, 
places like Russia, Mongolia, China and Tibet, right through the Himalaya, and as far west as Pakistan and Afghanistan, possibly over two million square miles. But a particularly good place is in the northern Indian state of Jammu and Kashmir. And we're in Ladakh's Hemis National Park, just here. We think this is a good place, not just because of the rugged terrain that the snow leopards use, but because the people who live here do see snow leopards from time to time. How many there are is a mystery which we hope to solve. We are camping in the heart of the steepest mountains because this is supposed to be perfect snow leopard country. It's certainly tough walking country. In fact, we're probably crazy to even try to film snow leopards because they're so rare. But that's what makes them so desirable. You know they're out there somewhere. Trying to find them becomes an obsession. Fortunately, these ghost-like cats leave clues all over the mountains, and helping us understand them is old friend and local snow leopard expert, Rinjin Wanchuk. He's a great observer, and is already finding signs of the big cats not far from camp. Lovely fresh tracks, just a few hours old. Snow leopards like to keep in touch, so leave messages for each other, and we hope we can learn to read them too. Rinchin tells us that snow leopards need lots of space, so at frequent intervals they scrape up these piles of earth and sometimes pee on them to make sure other cats keep their distance. Surprise meetings might be dangerous, so they also post messages on overhanging rocks by spraying urine. It's strong stuff so we can smell them too. Snow leopards share these mountains with local herders, and because predators like snow leopards and Tibetan wolves occasionally kill domestic stock, the local villages are a good place for us to find out if the big cats have been seen recently. Much of this area of the Himalaya is blessed with the Buddhist faith, and as this culture reveres all life, predators are usually tolerated. Rinjin visits these villages regularly, and as our horseman Namgel lives here, we'll always be on the local grapevine. Mind you, the villagers hardly ever see snow leopards, but they know that the cats do a lot of walking and have big territories, so finding them in this rugged terrain will be challenging. Snow leopards are only six to seven feet long and really well camouflaged. And we don't even know how many there are living here. A handful at most. One strategy that might help is to keep an eye on the snow leopard's favorite prey in these parts, the baral, a type of wild sheep. Baral look amazingly agile on these steep cliffs, but we're told this is also the snow leopard's favorite hiding place. So baral are always on the lookout for the superbly camouflaged cats. If they see a snow leopard, the baral should alert us, so we watch them carefully, but whenever possible, climb down to base camp at night. Working at 15,000 feet isn't far up by Everest standards, but it's high enough to make the lack of oxygen a potential killer. Sleeping lower down is safer, and in this cold, returning to camp is a welcome relief. Tasty meals are supplied by our Ladakhi team, giving us all a chance to discuss our strategy. Snow's good though. Good for tracking. Yeah, it'll be worth trying. Thanks, Sam. No, that's okay. Oh, gotta get out there. The team has a plan, but after just three weeks, the high altitude and freezing temperatures are taking their toll. Few have come this close to finding snow leopards before and they're discovering why.
All the walking has been with a purpose, for the team has been collecting every clue they can find. It means Mitchell can now get down to some clever detective work and maybe outsmart the snow leopards. Whenever any of us has found a pug mark or a fresh scrape or a rock spray or heard a vocalization, I've marked it on this map of the area. And all of a sudden, there are enough maps for a pattern to emerge. It seems that the snow leopards are favoring just the easiest routes to, to travel on. And this kind of information is priceless. Now we're really making progress. For by knowing about their favorite routes along the valleys and ridges, we might make a success of Mitchell's plan to get the snow leopards to take self-portraits. We've brought along some technical trickery, little video cameras that will trigger automatically when and if the cats walk through the beams. They're like a home security system and work day and night. For lighting is provided by an infrared lamp which the cats can't see. So by the time we've buried the cables and hidden the cameras, the snow leopards won't be frightened by them. Well, we hope not. Yeah, that's triggered. That's nice. You should be able to see the snow leopards coming up the valley and right past the camera. Now we have to wait for the pussy gap. Their plan seems good, but it's five weeks since they've started and they still haven't seen a cat. And with the mileage piling up, the team is struggling. We've all been walking for 13 consecutive days without exposing a single frame of film. And I guess I should be getting discouraged, but patience always was going to be a big part of making a film about snow leopards. At this altitude, there's only half as much oxygen available to your heart and lungs. I'm trying to learn to think like a snow leopard. I just wish I could breathe like one. Knowing they're out there somewhere just makes the whole landscape almost vibrate with tension. The perverse thing is, I've probably been seen by snow leopards dozens of times, but their camouflage is so perfect and the distances are so great that the only real chance you've got of seeing one is if it moves. And with such a big area to scan, you just have to break it up in your mind. If it's cold, look on the sunny faces. If it's windy, look on the sheltered sides. If there are burrow grazing, look on the approaches above them. The snow leopard has to be there somewhere. It's the crucial breakthrough the expedition needed. Mitchell's first tantalizing sight of a snow leopard. Immediately, they want more. Something much closer. But have the remote cameras worked? Nice fresh pug marks. And a fresh scrape. We've had so many false hopes when cats have come past and the technology's let us down, like flat batteries and digital breakup due to the cold. That uh, got frustrating, but rewind the tape and see whether we got lucky this time. 
The problem with remote cameras is that they're non-selective. And as the snow leopards share these tracks with the locals, we capture plenty of useless images. We just rewind the tapes to use them again and hope for better luck. Oh, we have got lucky. It's a snow leopard. It's the yak from the village. Just a bit too big to eat. Now, what else have we got? Oh, a cat by the rock. Oh, the camera's screwed up, damn it. Ah! Oh. Wonderful. First close-up views of a snow leopard. Just gonna have another look at that. This is such good news. Because now we know the system works, we might be able to identify individuals, learn how often they pass by, and even get some idea how many snow leopards live here. What a beautiful cat. He's got a little twist in his tail. Did you notice that? That might help us to identify this one if we see it again in the next few weeks. Great. Let's see if we can get another one. Rinchen suspects that this flat rock is an important snow leopard signpost, and after a few days, we get our first hit, a chuck or partridge. And a couple of days later, this magnificent cat. And for the first time ever, a snow leopard is recorded visiting and refreshing a rock scent. This is magical. It's becoming clear that this smelling and face rubbing allows each snow leopard to know who went past and how long ago. And spraying their own urine under the rock is a calling card, enabling them to keep in touch, the scent's pungent and long-lasting. We move the camera around, and four days later, another snow leopard visits the rock. We're discovering that each cat comes by about every three to 10 days. There's so little to eat here that they have to share home ranges, but meeting could be dangerous. So these rock sprays help to keep them apart. We've hidden four cameras in various spots, but things often go wrong. This tentative snow leopard took so long to approach that the camera turns off just after it enters frame. A real breakthrough comes when this female leads two young snow leopards through the shot. A breeding age female is terrific news. Since her youngsters are about a year old, it would be reasonable to hope for a litter of little cubs in about 18 months' time, and that would be a real prize. We're excited to be getting such lovely pictures of the cats, and we hope that these images will help us to identify individuals from the patterns on their beautiful coats. But it's proving tricky. They say a leopard never changes its spots, but snow leopards do especially when they're walking, because their thick fur moves so much. The snow leopard's coat pattern is so complex that I'm trying to sort out who's who by sketching some of the cats that I've filmed by playing back the footage on this little monitor here. Some of them are fairly easy to tell apart. This one, for instance, this very dark-faced snow leopard, who I think is a female, is very distinctive. So I think if we see her again, she should be reasonably easy to identify. And this might be the same cat, but these distant shots are too far for identification of individuals. Experience is showing us that we can safely creep the cameras in closer to the snow leopards without disturbing them. By rewinding the image, we can determine where to move in for more detail. We try hard to decipher which marks separate individuals reliably. We assume the face is important, but is it the fronts or backs of legs or the patterns on the top or bottom of these exquisite tails?
we begin to see this guy quite often, a male because of his bulk and his white head. We hope we'll be able to recognize him if we see him again, even at a distance, because he's a slightly yellowish color. And he carries the end of his tail with a distinctive twist. It's great that the technology works, and the pictures are lovely, but we really need IDs if we're to follow the cats and film more intimate behavior. We could do with some help. And we have the perfect person in Rodney Jackson, director of the Snow Leopard Conservancy, and one of the world's leading experts on this elusive cat. Okay, good sight. With the help of our friend Rinchin, He's now attempting to census all the cats in our corner of Ladakh's Hemis National Park. Rodney hopes individual snow leopards can be identified from still photographs of their lovely coat patterns. We have only four cameras. Rodney has 30. But it'll still take months to accumulate enough pictures. Okay, Ren, so, let's try so we'll have to be three. patient. Great, really nice. Sometimes these mountains can seem cruel. We're living up here at 12,000 feet for weeks on end, and the sub-zero temperatures feel unrelenting. And then, every time we want to film a snow leopard, it seems to involve a really grueling climb of up to three hours. But the other day, I was amused to see that we I weren't alone in finding this place hard. I was watching a snow leopard climbing up this ridge and uh, it kept on having to stop to catch its breath. We know we'll need a lot of luck if we're to achieve one of our main aims, to film snow leopards hunting. So we're keen to keep tabs on this cat. But snow is a problem. It's dangerous for us to follow the cat on slippery slopes. And difficult for the snow leopard too, because its camouflage doesn't work so well when it's walking over snow. In this toughest of lands where prey is so scarce, a snow leopard can do without handicaps. And moving around on ice-covered mountains when you can't see your footing is treacherous, even for a snow leopard. Despite the conditions, snow leopards have to keep traveling, not just to find prey, but to mark their home ranges. When it's snowed, it's easy to see how overhanging rocks provide protection for the messages left underneath by each passing cat. Defending their space like this is always important because there's not enough food to share but the hazards of winter also bring opportunity. It's a big chance for Hugh and his team too. Snow leopards have never been filmed hunting, and now is a great time because their most important prey, the Baral, are starting their mating season. And that means they may be a bit distracted. Most of the time, the burrow are super vigilant, but when they're rutting like this, the burrow lose a lot of their caution. And if I was a snow leopard, I'd be watching the burrow rut very carefully. Males have to find out which females are coming into estrus and then make sure that they're the ones that corner the female in order to mate. But that also means chasing off competing males on such steep cliffs, there's a constant danger of injury or death, and of course a chance for a hungry snow leopard.
After the rut, the snow leopards' chances of hunting success increase still further because the male baral are exhausted and must find food to replenish their wasted bodies. The snow leopards keep a close eye on them, but must still mark their home ranges to protect their space. Snow leopards overlap ranges with each other, but also tried to avoid meeting for fear of potentially dangerous conflict. And this is not their only problem. What strikes me about this place is the deafening silence. It sounds devoid of life, but feels really tense. For the animals out there are fighting an elemental battle against hunger and cold. When it's so quiet, it must be tough for a snow leopard to stalk a barrel. The cliffs are so steep that one carelessly placed paw could dislodge a rock and alert his prey. This is the local male, the one with a twist in his tail. He's making good use of his superb camouflage and his great stealth. With that thick set muscular body, short powerful legs and that gorgeous long tail to counterbalance during swift turns on steep slopes, he's the ultimate mountain killer. There's so little food at this time of year that the Baral have to dig for roots. And with heads down like this, they're vulnerable. But the scars of a snow leopard's claws and teeth on this one's neck shows that the attacks can be shaken off. Snow leopards have been known to kill prey three times their own weight. This male weighs about a hundred pounds, and to aid acceleration, he'll most likely attack from above, but only if he can get close enough to the barrel. couldn't believe our luck. We'd started out thinking we'd be lucky to even see a snow leopard, and Mitchell had just filmed the first ever shots of one hunting. It's a great step forward. We weren't the only ones to witness the hunt. We're told that Tibetan wolves are the snow leopard's main competitor, and though they also hunt Baral, they're not averse to scavenging. The wolf doesn't know the snow leopard failed and will try to steal the kill it thinks is hidden somewhere nearby. Facing such a threat, snow leopards simply avoid wolves. It's easy for them to just disappear. Winters here are long and hard, summers all too brief. The growing season is short, the only moisture provided by melting snow and a sprinkle from India's monsoon rains. The Baral climb higher, followed by snow leopards, 
And since one of our ambitions is to film snow leopard cubs, and they're born in the summer, Mitchell goes up searching for them. One of the best places to look for snow leopards in summer is a marmot colony. These plump rodents hibernate in burrows in winter, but as the snow melts, they emerge to become prey for snow leopards. Marmots are also a favorite prey of golden eagles. Living in a place where food is scarce, marmots make a tasty meal, so are always wary and alert. But they must eat too, for summer's new growth provides the fat to survive the long winters. They just have to risk exposure to attack. Nice to see a bit of action, but despite weeks of effort, we fail to see a snow leopard. All is not lost, however. The Baral have given birth, and for a few weeks at least, youngsters are likely to be on the snow leopard's menu. Mothers must feed hard so they can nurse their offspring while keeping an eye out for hungry snow leopards. And though all seems tranquil, the discovery of fresh snow leopard scent sends the Baral into panic. At the slightest hint of a snow leopard's presence, the youngsters are programmed by evolution to run for cover on the cliffs. Even if this is where the snow leopards would most likely be hiding. But if they are, we aren't seeing them. In fact, Mitchell's been trying for several months to get the cats more confident by leaving his human scent on remote cameras nearby. We feared the technique might have frightened them off. We were wrong. Well, after all the frustrations and the bad weather, we've finally broken the drought and we've filmed a snow leopard in summer. The plan that I had to start to get the snow leopards used to my presence has paid off with spectacular results. I think it's the two cubs we filmed last winter. The other one is in the distance. I'm sure it's the male that's close to the camera. He's obviously either smelt me on the camera, but he's found it and he's accepted it. And that's a major breakthrough now in what we can do. This young male's a magnificent young snow leopard. He's got so much spunk. I've got to rewind this and look at this again. Because this interaction with the camera is gorgeous. What I love about this footage is the, the juxtaposition. You've got a snow leopard, which is about as wild as you can be and still be on planet Earth, batting around the very latest in surveillance technology, like it was just an old dead hare. It's just wonderful. That really sums up for me the essence of the snow leopard, that confidence that it has in its own obscurity. It knows it's almost invisible in the landscape and therefore it can act and travel as it likes. They're just swaggering away. They're wonderful, wonderful young leopards. Not quite the young cubs we hoped for, but a great pair of teenagers, and according to the locals, just the age when they might get into trouble. Being inexperienced hunters, they'd be more likely to raid the local villages for a carelessly guarded goat. In virtually every part of the snow leopard's range, the big cats share the meagre resources with people, and the relationship is tense.
snow leopards do occasionally kill domestic stock, and life is tough enough for these mountain people without losing their valuable animals. So they sometimes kill the big cats. Fortunately, Buddhism's reverence for life helps to protect snow leopards in these parts most of the time, but not in many areas, and the killing of cats for Eastern medicine and their beautiful coats continues. Just the other day, we found a trap with fresh bait in it, designed to capture wolves as well as snow leopards, with steep walls to prevent escape. It was a sharp reminder of how immediate the threat is to the snow leopard's future. It's thought that fewer than 5,000 snow leopards survive in the wild, and this number is falling, so they're officially designated as endangered. If herders lose valuable animals to snow leopards, they'll only be conserved if people are tolerant. So much of Rodney and Rinchin's work involves building local support, and Rinchin visits remote villages all over Ladakh. He listens to their problems and encourages careful management of sparse grazing. Good husbandry means wildlife increases, and so does wildlife tourism. This provides the villagers with alternative income, which takes the pressure off predators. If poaching is to be detected and stopped, it'll be vital to identify individual snow leopards in the population. That's one of Rodney and Rinchin's goals with their camera traps. And it's our hope that the information they've been collecting will help us track the leopards and film their most intimate behavior. So this is your study area, is it, Rodney? Yes, um, covers an area of about 100 square kilometers. Oh, I see, the, the whole watershed and camps here, isn't it? Right, that's our camp. And you can see rock sands located along the intersecting valleys. They are um, used by literally all of the cats that come through the area. <laughs> Looks like traffic chaos. Indeed, and these circles show where we place camera traps. They have to be located very strategically because our aim here is to photograph all the snow leopards so that we can get an accurate count of the animals. And how many different cats have you identified? To date, um, we've identified five um, resident cats and maybe another two to three transient animals. Great pictures. These are the movements of the resident male. One day he walked three kilometers in just two hours. Goodness, impressive. We call him Mikbar, Ladaki for red eye, from the fact that he has a scar above his right eye, probably inflicted by another male. A twist in his tail. We photographed him a lot. That's great. He patrols all this area. Don't we got these two shots the other night. McBar following a female. Smashing it's up. a sure sign that the mating season is upon us. Filming mating would be an amazing thing to achieve, though no doubt impossible, because no one's ever even seen it before. Now Rodney's confirmed that Mikmar is the territory holding male, it's no wonder he patrols around and marks so often, especially as this is now the mating season. Rodney says that from early January to mid-March, Mikmar will increase his marking activity three to five times. He wants to make sure that he is the one to mate with any passing females. Spray rocks now take on a whole new significance. This is our local female called Dolma, and if she's coming into breeding condition, she'll want Mi'kmaq to know about it. Dolma's urine carries the vital information. Her normal message of keep away has now become, you're welcome to approach. And next day, Mi'kmaq is on her trail. Snow leopards are normally three days to a week's walk away from each other. Now he's only three hours behind her. And next night he goes to the spray rock to pick up Dolma's message.
Her perfume has really impressed him. He's making quite a meal of it. His open mouth and flared nostrils allow him to read her message more clearly. That's a snow leopard calling. We think it's our dark-faced female, Dolma. from that ridge top since before dawn. This is the only time of year adult snow leopards call to each other. For the rest of the year, all the scrapes and sprays are saying, stay away from me. And now all of a sudden it's, here I am, come and join me. She's chosen a brilliant spot, these cliffs to bounce the sound off. And these three valleys to the north, the south, and one behind me to funnel the sound further clever girl. She's using the very shape of the mountains themselves to overcome their scale. This is definitely Mi'kmaq orbiting around her. If they're like other big cats, they may call like this for hours, just coming together and wandering apart. I've never seen a wild mating before, so I just don't know what to expect. surprised by how gentle this is. These two are really taking their time. Come on guys. Are you mating or just sitting together? Pretty amazing to film something that hasn't even been seen before. Difficult to believe, really. But can we find the resulting cubs? After this success, Mitchell is feeling more confident. For the first time since starting, I finally feel like we're starting to get somewhere in trying to think like the snow leopards and trying to use the terrain like they would. There's still a long way to go, but it feels good high up on these ridge trails, traveling and resting where the snow leopards do. But we're still behind the snow leopards, only anticipating their actions as tiny percentages of the time. The only thing to do, I think, is keep, keep walking and keep looking. Climbing to high altitude can be dangerous and Mitchell has already suffered from some alarming headaches. But with the promise of young cubs on the horizon, the team has new energy and determination. We'd failed to find cubs in three years of searching, but after witnessing the mating, Mitchell is back for a final summer attempt. Camping high at 15,000 feet, he plans to stake out Baral herds in the hope Dolma and her cubs will show up. 
finding the burrow herds is easy as usual, but there's no sign of snow leopards. And all day I'm stalked by a biting headache. I become disoriented and by the next morning, I'm staggering and vomiting. I just can't believe that after all these years, the high altitude is suddenly affecting me. By the next day, I can't even stand that I'm coughing up froth. I hallucinate and twice lose consciousness as Numgill brings me down to base camp on the back of his yak. Mitchell's final attempt to find small cubs nearly ends in disaster. He's close to death from acute mountain sickness. It is crucial that he be transported to a lower altitude if he is to survive. He's evacuated to the nearest hospital. Mitchell has shot so much remarkable film that his departure is a big loss. But we're still hoping to find Mikmar and Dolmar's little cubs and film a cat on a kill. So we start our fourth winter in the mountains with clear goals. Mitchell has made a good recovery after leaving hospital, but is unable to return to altitude just yet. So in his absence, we press on. One of our camera sites is on a high ridge, and after a two year wait, Mitchell will be delighted to know that a cat has finally visited his favorite spot. Mitchell calls this the menu site because snow leopards can survey this lovely landscape from up here and decide what they'll kill for their next meal. We're still determined to film those little cubs or even a snow leopard feeding on a kill and fresh snowfall is giving us a head start. We find Mi'kmaq out patrolling his territory. He seems casual in his movements, unconcerned as he spooks the herds of Baral. Wondering what he's up to, we pick up his tracks and follow him up one of his favorite valleys, hoping he'll lead us to cubs or a kill. And he does. We've obviously disturbed him off this dead Baral and in a panic, quickly snatch a few video shots of the carcass because we've spotted him up on a ridge. Hopefully, he'll return to the kill. So we set up a hide and wait all night. At dawn, we spot Mikmar on guard nearby. He seems too fat to bother chasing scavengers away. So a fox takes its chance to snatch a few morsels, burying them to create a larder for the hard times ahead. Within an hour, Mikmar is back. The life of a top predator is one of feast or famine. This is a feast. No doubt Mi'kmaq is relieved to get a good feed. And we're relieved too. For after four years, we finally have our close-up shots of a snow leopard feeding on a wild baral kill. It's a privilege and a rare sight. In fact, it's difficult to express what a thrill it is to get probably the closest film ever taken of a wild snow leopard. There's also a sense of fulfillment because over the years, we've got to know a snow leopard well enough to give him a name. And Rodney's confirmed that Mi'kmaq is just one of five local cats, with about three other transients identified too. It's these interlopers that Mi'kmaq has to keep out, and his scarred face suggests he's had a long and violent life protecting his patch.
After analyzing all our video images, we've discovered that when we first started filming four years ago, our first close shots were of this cat. It's nice to know that Mick Maher and the team go back a long way. After an hour's feed, Mikmar seems to be leaving. Possibly a happy cat. Certainly a fat cat. But he can't resist a final accusing look at our lens. Reluctantly, we have to leave too. We're relieved of our obsession only because our time has run out. And we've failed to find Mikmar and Dolma's little cubs. But while removing our remote cameras, we find the tracks of a mum with a cub. We leave the cameras out, hoping we'll finally get lucky. And after a couple of days, we film what looks like Dolma. But the camera timer that limits the length of shot lets us down, and we don't see a cub. We think our last chance is gone. But next day, Mum comes into shot again, followed by a long pause. After four years, we finally have our picture of a fluffy little snow leopard cub. Then it vanishes like a ghost, as if to convince us that snow leopards really are impossible. The elusive cat has finally beaten us, for we haven't filmed a successful hunt or a mum with little cubs. But I guess that's how it should be. For four years, Hugh Miles, Mitchell Kelly and their team have tracked these beautiful cats across the roof of the world. They've brought back the most remarkable images ever seen of snow leopards. But despite their success, they've given us just a tantalizing glimpse. Protected by this fortress of mountains, the snow leopard's veil of secrecy still remains. And much of their elusive lives continues to be a mystery.